All right, so welcome back to the After Hours Podcast. I'm your host, Francisco. With my co-host today, we got Joey. And joining us today is Amy Spalsbury from LFG Gaming Bar. Um, how you doing, Amy? I'm doing good. How are you guys? Oh, yeah, we're doing pretty good. Um, this is... Uh, it's May 19th right now, and stuff's starting to open back up, so it's looking pretty good. We're hoping soon we can do podcasts in real life again instead of, you know, digitally. I mean, we enjoy doing them digitally, but there's just, like, that extra layer of uh, atmosphere when you go in person, you know? Oh, yeah, for sure. I totally get it. Yeah, so um, how'd you get into, you know, the food and beverage industry, and, you know, why, why Kalamazoo? Um, well, I was born and raised in Kalamazoo, went to Kalamazoo Central, graduated there 2007. Then I actually had moved for a year to go to culinary school in Minnesota. I went to Lake Cordon Bleu. Once I graduated culinary school, I was thinking about staying in Minnesota, but then I ended up coming back home because that's where like my mom lives and a lot of my family and friends. And I ended up getting um, a job as a cook at a place called Webster's in Kalamazoo. It's in our, like, one of the more, like, fine dining steakhouses in Kalamazoo. It was in the Radisson, and I started kind of just working my way up until um, I was getting pretty close to actually being, like, the sous chef of Zazio's at one point. That's pretty much how I just kept on expanding my culinary knowledge. What made you decide to um, leave a restaurant and then start your own, you know, bar? I first got inspired. My husband and I um, were going down to Florida. He's a big wrestling fan. And I had bought him tickets to WrestleMania in Orlando, Florida a few years ago. And he's he's wonderful. And he basically said, hey, since we're going to WrestleMania, because I'm not like a huge wrestling fan. He was like, hey, like, since we're going to WrestleMania, like anything else that you want to do when we're in Orlando, like, let's do it. We're both huge gamers. And I just kind of started like Googling things. And I ended up finding this place called Player One in Orlando. And I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. Like a gaming bar. I've never heard of this before. And I was just blown away. I was like, this is the coolest experience I've ever had in my life like there was just like retro video games arcade games um we were playing super smash brothers up at the bar it was super awesome and i just remember being like i want to do this like i want to open a bar and like the first like day that i was there i was like i want to do this i really want to open this bar like i think this would be such a good idea like kalamazoo is a college town and i got super super stoked and it was all kind of like a silly dream at the time and then i ended up doing like a business study at Western. Um, I went through the school of business in Western where they were like, yeah, this would be a pretty good idea. They helped me with my business plan. They helped with budgeting. They gave me some ideas of locations. They did a lot of like that, like grunt work that you have to do initially, which I really appreciated. Then over time, I just slowly started to form my business plan. And then I was able to get the place that I have now and I haven't looked back since. So yeah. That's awesome. So you said you're in a college town with uh, Western Michigan and Kalamazoo College being there. Um, Would you say a lot of people that come in are college students? Um, A decent amount. I don't think there's as many as I initially was expecting. But at the same time, I'm kind of okay because a lot of like the the college bars get really rowdy. And we're a lot more chill than that, which I mean, in my college days, I totally get it. Like I'd want to go out, you know, like the place and get super plastered and forget everything. And we're, we're definitely a lot more different and chill in that regard. We do get some college kids, um, but usually it's the college kids that I think don't necessarily feel comfortable going out to a bar and would rather go to like an atmosphere where, yeah, you can drink or you can hang out with your friends, but there's not that like requirement of getting like super hammered. <laughs> Yeah, you can just go and get a few drinks and play some games and you're good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're all about like a really like chill, calm atmosphere. So that's that's like one thing which even though I was expecting to, there to be a lot more college kids, I'm kind of also thankful that like I get like a huge variety of different people. So then that way people have like this more welcoming atmosphere. So it just makes it a little bit a better atmosphere for everybody. Nice. So going off of that, what would you say is your uh, favorite part about owning a bar? Honestly, I love I love seeing people's faces for the first time that they come in and they get super excited. They're like, oh my gosh, I played Sonic when I was a kid or Mario Kart. And I just love like seeing them just be super stoked and really excited to like relive their childhood. That's like one of the big highlights for me. Another really big highlight is that I get to be my own boss. <laughs> it's really nice. 
especially just, I, I love my employees. I love being able to, I feel like, you know, they're my support system and I'm happy to be able to help them as much as I can too. And so there's a lot of highlights to it out of all of the stress, but those are a couple of them. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine. Um, so how do you guys like decide what gaming consoles you're going to bring in or like arcade games and stuff like that? It's usually whatever is most popular. Um, another thing I also put into consideration too, especially for our video game consoles, what games can usually do two to four players. Um, the issue with, because we've got I think eight TVs right now, nine kind of, I want to make sure that at least two people can play just because if it's just one person on each TV, there's really not much room to be able to bring in your friends and play games together. So that has a lot of um, contribution to it. And then also, I usually kind of look to see what arcade games are more popular. Like we just, before we closed, we actually had just gotten a Dance Dance Revolution arcade machine, which is super, super popular. And we've actually had a lot of people come back and like just come and play all the time, which is awesome. I also play myself, so... (laughs) But it's just, it's whatever's most popular for a lot of people. Like, and also too, like I usually listen, I try to get feedback from our community too. So I'll do like polls every now and then like, Hey, what, you know, what game would you like to see? And then if I get enough interest in it, then usually I'll, I'll end up getting it. Yeah, for sure. Get a couple of drinks, do a little dance dance, you know, sounds pretty fun. Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. There's some people that are so hardcore and I just am like, I'm standing there. Like, I think I'm doing so well. And then I watch somebody else and I'm like, Oh yeah, no, they're on a whole other level. (laughs) That's usually how it goes with video games though. Like you always think you're the best and then there's somebody else that's just, you know, God tier and it's like, ah, well, that's a confidence (laughs) breaker. (laughs) So accurate, yeah. (laughs) So what did you start off playing, you know, like in your childhood or, you know, like what what got you into gaming? So my, my parent, my dad was actually a huge gamer. Um, we got a Super Nintendo when I was a kid and then Sega. When I really started playing, I usually, I, uh, really started playing Sonic the Hedgehog 2. That's a game that I played all the time with my parents and also, uh, Tetris Attack and Toe Jam and Earl. Those are like the three games that I, I remember. And then one that like really had a huge impact on me when I was, I think I was eight or nine at the time was Zelda Ocarina of Time. That's, that was a big one for me. All great choices. I, I remember when I was a kid, too, the kind of the same on the Sega. I play a lot of Mortal Kombat and uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. So, yep. <laughs> yeah, Sonic, I always choose him over. I always choose Sonic over Mario. People think I'm crazy, but. <laughs> okay. It's, it's a hard choice. It's a hard choice. It depends. I, they're, they're both good in their own way. I mean, Mario's been like consistently better. But and he's been Mario has been had way better games, and unfortunately, Sonic the Hedgehog's kind of like fallen off the face of the earth in regards of games. But I still just always love OG Sonic. I don't know if you've seen the uh, most recent movie for Sonic, but that was actually pretty good as well. It was, yeah, I I did see it. I I was pleasantly surprised. I came, I went into it with zero expectations because I I had a feeling I was going to be disappointed, but there were some pretty funny moments. I really enjoyed Jim Carrey too as Robotnik. I thought he did a pretty good job because he's just, he's crazy. So it worked out. Oh, I, I completely agree watching it. I was watching with my family and I'm like, oh, it's Sonic, you know, it's a kid's movie, whatever. But then I kind of got into it like halfway through, like you said, you know, Jim Carrey's super funny. So yeah, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> Bro, you look like Sonic right now. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a haircut in a while. I might look a little bit like Sonic. Yeah, and you, and you have a blue hoodie with the hood up. So. <laughs> oh no, call me out. <laughs> but I, I gotta say, Mario Kart. I mean, just can't be beat. A little Mario Kart with the boys, you know, go out. Yep. I, I honestly think that Mario is the the superior superior uh, <laughs> side of that. I yeah, that's a good, that's a fair point. I did. I grew up and I usually always would smoke all the kids at Mario Kart. My mom used to be, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I would just destroy them all. I'm still pretty good. We did a Mario Kart tournament and I got second place. So <laughs> oh, nice, yeah, nice. But yeah. no, no shade to Sonic. He's great in his own right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I grew up. I mean, my parents had like the old Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES. Yep, yep. So like that was the first gaming console I played because like it was just like a hand me down, right? Mm-hmm. So I remember when I was like four or whatever, like I'd be playing that um, in like the old Super Mario World and stuff like that. So. Yeah, um, that just gets close to home, you know. Yep. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's a pretty fun system. And then um, I think the second system I got was PS2. I, I think that's right. And then yep. yeah, 
How about you, Joe? Oh, yeah, that was that was like the second one I got as well. I had, you know, all the Sega ones and stuff like that. But the first like big system was for sure uh, the PS2 as well. Yeah. Revolutionary. Yeah, that same for me. That's what I, I took a huge break from gaming for like six or seven years. And I think I got a PS2 when I was like 15 or 16. So you must be pretty young then. Yeah, yeah. I'm 31. So I, well, young-ish, I guess. I feel like I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it's, it's you, you own your own re- or own a bar at 31, so it seems like you're doing pretty well. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> That's pretty well said, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think I'm old, and I mean, because I just graduated college, so it's like, oh, man, like, now what do I do with my life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what I felt like the entire time after I graduated culinary school. I was like, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm doing it, so I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> right. So do you have any interesting stories from your customers or... People who go to your bar. Someone, someone rage quit and maybe like throw a controller at a TV or something. Oh, know. yeah. <laughs> I've been super, super lucky in that regard. I haven't had anybody throw any controllers. And we haven't really had any super crazy people all that much. Um, the best ones are probably when people get really drunk and then they start. We have Guitar Hero. And they suddenly think that they are ACDC or... <laughs> any like they start playing these songs and singing along and i'm just like oh no and it's right at our bar too so we so we listen to it all the time (laughs) so that's that's always that's fun (laughs) but um other than that we've actually it's been pretty calm i it's so funny um my general manager will attest to this so he it it's like clockwork every time i usually leave saturday nights around like midnight or one o'clock that's when around when we start to slow down and he closes and it always happens like every time after I leave, like he gets some sort of like belligerent person that comes in already drunk and he has to kick them out or has to ask them to leave or they're not good or they're denying them drinks. And it happens every single time. So I personally haven't experienced that many crazy stories, but then he's had a, a handful. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, any that you want to share? I don't know. I guess the craziest one that we had was this guy was pretty drunk and he had come in and wanted a drink and we're like hey like we'll get you some water we'll get you some fries and then you know we'll we'll see how you are after that he ended up taking the glass out to the bar or outside because we have an outside patio and i believe then he started trying to like walk out and then started trying to take the glass to like leave and we're like no 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 you can't do that well then he demanded that he was going to go drive home And then we're like, no, you can't do that either. Yeah, it was awful. It was like, you can't do this either. He started driving, but we had called the cops and the cops thankfully had stopped him before he did anything, but he started driving down the wrong side of the road. It was terrifying, but like, thankfully, like my, my general manager is fantastic. He's got a lot of experience. And so he had called the cops. And so thankfully they had gotten there in time before, like he did anything else crazy, but that was probably the most like escalated situation that we've had. That's terrifying. Yeah. I mean, anybody listening, it's, it's not worth drinking and driving. Don't, don't do any shit like that. Right. Oh yeah. And he even offered, he's like, Hey man, I'll buy you a cab. Like just wait a second. We'll get you an Uber. Like just give us a second. And yeah, he was, he was so gone that he just refused. Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you guys were able to handle the situation uh, in the correct manner and everything turned out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. And again, it was one of those things where, cause I, I remember getting a phone call, I think at like two 30 and um, Mandel, my GM was like, so there was a situation that happened and I just want to let you know. And I was like, Oh no. <laughs> it's, it's good that you guys got it under control. Um, and I don't think we asked you, uh, when did you guys open up? Uh, we opened up uh, November, two Novembers ago, November 16th of 2018. Okay. Yeah. What is something that you've learned from like the beginning when you first opened up your bar until now that you didn't even had you didn't even think of, or just something that you've added in the, your skill set? Well, one of them I think would be like social media and marketing. Um, I've never done any sort of social media or marketing. I have no background whatsoever, and um, I realize that I'm actually pretty good at it in regards of like being creative with posts and taking pictures and. Um, creating events and banners and things like that. That was something that I never knew I was good at doing. And so that was a pretty cool skill set that I picked up in this past year and a half. Honestly, I think my big thing was 
making sure that I ask for help. <laughs> That's what my employees are for rather than trying to do everything myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's for sure. It's all about building the right team around you, right? So. Oh, yeah. 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 And out of I've got seven employees right now and four of them have been here since um, day one. So happy about that. It's nice because everybody uh, everybody has their own personal experiences they've been through. So, you know, everybody has a little bit to offer. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool, too, because there's a lot of people like um, our tournament organizer who had, I had hired. Like initially, she was going to be like a host slash tournament organizer. But she's been doing tournaments for a long time. And so she has all of that experience that I have. It's just way over my head, which is just really nice because I can, you know, sit back and she can do all of our tournaments and make sure and people come because our tournaments are well organized. And it's just it's really nice having a good team that really has my back and vice versa. That's awesome. What's your most popular tournament? Our Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, for sure. Of course, of course. That's cool. <laughs> All the boys love playing that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we usually get anywhere from like 15 to 30 people every while we were every Sunday. Oh, dang. That's a pretty decent-sized tournament then. Yeah, yeah. Our um, our second tournament we do is uh, we do a fighting game night on Thursdays. So it's like Mortal Kombat, like the current ones, uh, Mortal Kombat, Tekken, Soul Calibur, um, Street Fighter, and that's a really a really cool group of people too. We usually get anywhere from about like fifteen to twenty five people for that one. So it's it's also a really good turnout for that one as well. And it's pretty cool because they still do weekly online tournaments. And I think that they actually have enough people now that they've been ab- able to um, do like payouts so people can put money in and then somebody gets a, a cash prize if they win, which is really cool. That's awesome. I might have to come uh, come up for one of those Mortal Kombat tournaments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Is, is there like a prize pool? Like, does a, does a winner get like a free drink or something? Um, actually, everybody. So on the fight night ones, I think it's five dollars for all of the games. So you can enter in Tekken and all of the games that they play. So if it's like five games and if twenty people enter, then it's I think it's first and second place. I believe that for each of the games, it might just be first place for each of the games. But for our ultimate tournaments. Um, everybody enters $5 and then it's cash prize for first, second, and third. And I know there's times before where first place has walked out with, you know, like 80 to $120, which is really cool. Right on. That's awesome. You talked about, or you talked earlier about, um, you know, social media and you're pretty good at it. Uh, I would definitely agree. I've seen your Instagram and I've seen your Facebook. They're awesome. Everybody check them out. Um, but also... You guys are like one of the only bars that I know of that use Twitch and I believe YouTube as well. Um, how did you come up with that? I mean, that's just, that's pretty smart. Um, well, part of it was, I can't take all the credit for it. Um, our tournament organizer and then a couple of guys that do our fight night tournaments, they really helped um, start doing our Twitch stream. They kind of took the reins on that and helped set everything up. And we thought that it would just be a really good way to do like cross promotion of, Hey, we're doing our super smash brothers tournament. That's a good way to get somebody that's never even heard of us before, maybe in Kalamazoo or maybe in Florida um, to watch our streams. And then, um, however, now since we're, we're closed, I decided I wanted to set up doing um, a Twitch stream Monday, Wednesday, Mm. Friday, where we do Jackbox games. And so people can actually play on their mobile phone. They just have to watch the stream and then it doesn't cost anything. Um, They just go to like jackbox.tv and they're able to play games along with everybody else, which is super, super fun. And then on Fridays, we actually do giveaways now too, but it was kind of a combination of people. So it was my tournament organizer and a couple of people. And then I just have been trying to continue on with doing the Twitch stream three times a week. Yeah, Jackbox, I've played that a decent amount. Uh, that's pretty good. I personally like uh, Murder Party Trivia. That's that's a good one for nice. me. Nice. So. I have to, yeah, I guess I, when I mean Jackbox, it's we do the Jackbox Party Pack games. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we do, I personally, I haven't played Murder Trivia. I think I'm actually, I might have that one. I might have to see if I do, because I know we've been trying to like play different games and expand the games that we've been playing. My personal yeah. favorite is Quiplash. I like that one a lot. That one can get pretty rowdy. That one's pretty good. Quiplash is mm-hmm. where everyone's given a prompt, right? And then you have to fill in the answer. Yes. Yep. And then, yeah. And then you vote on like the funniest answer. Yes. Yep. No, that was pretty cool. Yeah. I like that one a lot. I also, there's a uh, one called split the room, which is really fun. And then a lot of the people that um, play, they really like fibbage a lot too. That one's, I've played that once or twice. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've played it. What, what, uh, what do you have to do for that game? 
basically they give you some sort of random fact and you have to fill in the blank for the fact like it would be something like what was the prince of egypt's favorite dish and then you'd have to come up with a lie and then you would have to guess the truth as well but you have to come up with a good lie to where other people would pick your lie thinking that's actually the truth but it isn't the truth and then you'd have to find the truth yourself yeah it's like trying to manipulate the room oh that sounds super fun <laughs> i might have to try that one out <laughs> So do you stream when people come into the bar, like customers? Do you ever stream their gameplay? For a while, we do a little bit, like half and half. We usually, like, we'll watch, like, movies or something. And then other times we'll watch Twitch streamers. A lot of the times if somebody, like, actually says, hey, listen, like, can we watch my buddies playing League of Legends right now? And then we'll be like, oh, yeah, for sure. And we'll throw it up on the bar. Um, and then other people will reach out saying that they're a Twitch streamer. We've got a handful of people that we follow. I think we follow probably, like, 50 people right now if not a little bit more of people that are, that stream quite frequently and we'll, we'll have them, we'll host them up at the bar, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, so there's a lot of fun and unique names for everything on your menu. Uh, how do you come up with these names? A lot of them. I, I like puns. So I just think of some really good puns. So I just think of things that rhyme with each other. One time we had one, a sandwich called red bread redemption. Um, <laughs> so I just think of like fun puns. Usually and then I'm the one that creates the names, but then like Mandel is the one that usually comes up with the items, like in our cocktails, for instance, he, he always is the one that comes up with the recipes. I also had somebody else initially, she did all of like our recipes at the very beginning. Cause I have, I have zero like bartending experience whatsoever, or even I guess serving experience whatsoever up until I opened this. I've been thankful that I've had people that are more knowledgeable than I am in creating cocktails and I'm just the one that gets to come up with the names. <laughs> so do you put any of the food together? Cause you said you had a um, cooking background, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I do. Um, I create the menu, the food menu. All of those are, are my own creations or um, variations of things that I've had at other places. Um, a really good example is when I worked at Webster's, I had my sous chef, he had created, he would always make sushi rice and then he'd make this really tasty, uh, like soy mayo basically that would go with it. And I ended up deciding, I was like, oh my gosh, this is super tasty. Like, let me just deep fry it. And I asked him, I was like, can I use your soy aioli recipe? Because it's super good. And so our right there, uh, it's GTA rice city is what is on our menu, but they're deep fried rice balls with soy aioli. And they're a huge fan favorite. We have people asking about them all the time since we've closed. They're like, can you do to-go orders soon? <laughs> that sounds pretty good. I could definitely use that right about now. <laughs> oh, same. Uh, one of my personal favorites, I like the the Knuckles Poppers. That was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was, I, I try to come up with like things that are all mostly retro, but then I also like adding some like fun current ones as well. Like Roadhog's Nachos is another one. And then also pretty cool too, it's like co-op mode and then single player on your menu. So if you want to share or if it's just like a dish for yourself, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I was trying to think of something clever and then I realized I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is perfect because single player, yeah, for like sandwiches and entrees and then co-op mode. Yeah, I was I was stoked when I found that when I did that one because I like before I opened, I was trying to like come up with a menu and that was probably the most fun part out of everything for opening was coming up with the menus and like the names. And then I would just start like bouncing off ideas with my husband. Like we have um, Master Beef is one of our sandwiches and he came up with that name. And so it's just, that was a really fun highlight. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, what is the, the number one food that someone should try if they're coming in for the first time? I recommend the rice balls. I also really like our pizzas and also um, the Hedgehog's Chili Dog. I like that one the most. That's primarily just because um, we try to do as much local as we can within reason. That one is all local. So like the bun is from Sarkozy's Bakery. The broad is from Carlson Farms. The beef for the ground, the chili sauce and the onions are from uh, Chris Country Acres. So that's a really, really tasty one. And that's, I like supporting locals as much as I can. Oh man, I'm so hungry. <laughs> uh, that all sounds so good. Thank you. <laughs> Go, going off that, what is your best-selling drink? Um, right now, it's between uh, Plumber's Juice, which is like coconut rum, rum, and 
melon liqueur and a little bit of grenadine. And then the other one is Luigi's Sex Life. That one sells a lot. <laughs> and it's primarily because we layer it. So it's grenadine, so it's red at the bottom. And then it's pineapple juice and rum in the middle. So it's yellow in the middle. And then at the top, it's a blue carousel. Or sorry, it's just pineapple juice in the middle. And then in, at the top, it's blue carousel and rum at the top. So it's like red, um, red, yellow, and blue. And then once you mix it, it kind of turns a little bit green for a little while. And then it turns like a kind of like murky purple. I'm not sure why we decided Luigi's sex life, but it, I think that maybe that's his sex life. <laughs> uh, it, it sounds like it's great. And we're, uh, we were looking at your menu too. Luigi's man cave sounds pretty good as well. Oh yeah. That one's super, super tasty. That was one of our uh, previous bartenders. He had created that one. I like that one a lot. It's Mountain Dew or Mellow Yellow. And it's really cool because when you mix everything together, you top with the Mellow Yellow. And so it goes from like, a really, really dark green to a really light green. It's It looks really cool. Heck yeah. And then, I mean, I don't know. There's like a, just such, so many cool names on here. Sonic Boom, Pikachu Thunderbolt, you know, like Liquid Yoshi. <laughs> <laughs> I like Liquid Yoshi too. That's I feel like another, I have to just come in and just... That's another popular one. Oh yeah. I mean, I just got to come in and just try all of them, I guess. Like, that's the only way. <laughs> we also have, it's fun too because we have little phrases. Like, it's not on our actual website, but I put like little phrases underneath each of the drinks. So like under liquid Yoshi, it's no Yoshis were harmed in the making of this drink. <laughs> like uh, Robotnik's poison is one of them. It says uh, some side effects may include an egg shaped head and a dislike for hedgehogs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I had uh, another quick question. So, out of the people that, like, come there, when people, like, play games, do they generally play with their friends? Do they, like, collab- uh, collaborate a lot with others? Or how does that work? It's a mix of everything. I have some people that just come in on their own, and then they just hang out at the bar usually. We have a lot of regulars that just like to hang out at the bar. There's also, like, some older folk that just come in, and they just want to play Miss Pac-Man or Galaga, which is always super cool. And then it's really fun watching sometimes where there's groups of people that – decide that they're going to all play Mario Kart together or even we have a bunch of board games too. So we've had it to where somebody's like gone up to another table and is like, Hey, do you want to play this board game with us? And they're super down for it, which is a super, it's, it's really fun. Um, Cause it just feels, it feels like a community and it feels like everybody wants to hang out with each other. Yeah. I mean, everyone going there, they can, they can relate to gaming in some, some sense. Right. And then you also have board games too. And I mean, who doesn't like to be included? Right. So right, exactly. that's pretty awesome. Yeah. What board games do you generally keep there? We have a giant, a huge box of for Cards Against Humanity. Um, we've got What Do You Mean? We've got Jenga, Connect Four. We have a, a lot of like the more, I guess, mainstream popular games. And then we also have some like, I know we have Catan, I think is what it's called. I'm not as popular. I don't know as much of like the tabletop games, but we do have a, to- a couple of tabletop games as well. So how has uh, the COVID-19 outbreak affected your guys' bar? And do you guys have any big plans uh, around reopening? Well, it's affected us a lot just because we decided to stay completely closed. Um, We closed on March 14th. And the biggest reason why was because our food sales weren't nearly as high as our liquor sales. People usually come in and drink. They might get an appetizer or something, but we don't do a crazy amount in food sales. And so my biggest worry was staying open for to-go food and then having a lot of product go to waste and not make enough money to like actually keep the lights on and the gas on and all that. Um, so we just decided to remain closed. I We plan on hopefully by the, either the end of this month or the beginning of this month, at least reopening for to-go food. Everything's still kind of up in the air. I know that our stay-at-home order is supposed to be lifted on May 29th, but I also know that it looks like we're doing it by sections in regards of restaurants and bars. My biggest fear is for us, because there's so many little things that people can touch, like arcade games and video games, and it's a lot more interactive than any of the other bars around here. And my biggest fear is that we're not going to have a significant amount of people coming in just because they don't necessarily want to be at risk because we're going to have to constantly wipe things down, making sure everything is um, safe for everybody. I worry that people are probably not going to come out for a while. So we are going to open for to-go food. And I guess I'm not sure 
when we're actually going to reopen. And I know when we do reopen, we're definitely going to have it to a rate like 50% capacity rather than normal and like require masks and just making sure that everybody is staying as safe as possible. Wiping down all the games right after they play and stuff like that. Yep. And then um, we're also going to have hand sanitizing station and also like uh, the wet wipes or the, or the sanitizer wipes that people can also, if they're concerned about them not being wiped down, they can wipe them down themselves. And I think we also might do something where we have like gloves available for people too, if they, if they're wanting to game, but don't want to touch anything with their hands. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Do you have a hangover recipe? And if so, what is it? <laughs> Hangover recipe, I usually just end up ordering to-go food of either a burger or Chinese food. <laughs> that's my hangover recipe. <laughs> it sounds, that's a great choice. <laughs> that sounds so terrible because it's like I, with being a chef, it's like you should want to cook. But then if I'm hungover, there's no way that I want to like put any effort into making any food at all. So I'm usually just like, bam. Like I think it was like a couple weeks ago, I... I had too much bourbon one night and didn't realize it. And then I was like, the room was spinning at the end of the night and I woke up and I ended up getting like to go Chinese food and just ate a crap ton of like crab rangoons and greasy noodles. And it helped. (laughs) That sounds so good. What type of bourbon did you have? Uh, I had Maker's Mark. Always a good one. Always a good one. Yes. Yeah. I've been digging the Maker's Mark. One of of my personal favorites is a bullet. If you ever had that. I haven't actually. It's, it's a pretty good one. I'd, I'd recommend it if uh, you like bourbon. Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah, I have, again, it's like I always forget with my little alcohol knowledge that I have, I forget that there's like hundreds and thousands of different liquors out there. And I usually am just like, oh, I'll just keep on sticking to the same thing. <laughs> since, since we're on the topic, what are your go-to drinks? I was a big sucker for beer for a really long time. And then I've been really digging the old fashions lately. And then way back in the day, I, I used to love, uh, they're called Mexican mules, where it was tequila instead um, with uh, ginger beer and lime. And that was super good. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. One of the crazier things that I've tried, and it actually wasn't too bad, was uh, Monster Energy Drink, just like the standard, you know, green, yeah. and yeah. then mixing that with uh, Crown Apple. Ooh, nice. That's that kind of a, an adventurous one. Uh, yeah. I've had that a couple times. I don't really regret it when I'm drinking it, but then the next morning it's like you come down from caffeine and also hangover. So it's not the greatest. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've made that mistake before where I've had a lot of caffeine where I do like a Red Bull and vodka or something and I drink so many and I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, oh, like with a big like, headache. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> worst case scenario of all worlds. <laughs> so kind of going back here, what's something you would say you failed at and then later overcame? One big one would be our initial food menu. When I first opened with being like a more fine dining culinary background, I was like, yeah, I really want to do elevated sandwiches and elevated appetizers that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily get at a normal bar. No one was a big fan of that, primarily just because of my clientele. They'd rather have like mozzarella sticks and jalapeno poppers and things like that, which there's nothing wrong with because I I love me some jalapeno poppers. But I initially at the time, I was really like, yeah, I want to do I was doing like I had a really good uh, portobello sandwich. Um, It was like a burger, basically, but with portobello mushroom. I had done a couple of like really like fancier dips. And looking back on it, I realized I was like, oh, okay, like this makes sense. Like our food sales were down at that point. Uh, quite significantly and so I kind of took a step back and I swallowed my pride because I was like okay this is a bar people want bar food which is totally okay but it still was like one of those things where I was like man I really wish like people had ordered like that's that burger more because I was or the portobello burger more because I really loved it a lot but then I had to accept the fact I was like oh no not everybody's gonna love this so I ended up having to rework the menu and then did more like bar food and it's it's helped significantly. So our our food sales went up a lot. We sell a lot more food now, which is awesome. Right. It's just one of those things, just knowing your customer. And I mean, you really couldn't have known until you tried, right? So. Exactly. Yep, exactly. I personally 
think a portobello burger sounds really good. It was so good. It came with like pesto and then I made it. It was called tomato jam and earl. I think that's what it was called. It was like a, a joke of toe jam and earl, but it had like tomato jam and pesto. And then it came with like a really good like rascas and ported cheese and then fried onions on top. Oh my gosh, it was so good. <laughs> Uh, it's making me hungry just talking about it. <laughs> we have to stop doing these podcasts when we're hungry. I know. Or at least you know while you're doing it or something. <laughs> I know. We either need to like eat while we're doing them or eat before or something. But even if I eat before, I feel like talking about this food, I'm still going to get hungry again. Right. <laughs> have some food um, on standby. <laughs> every, every time. If you were operating a bar, what do you think you'd be doing right now? I probably would try to be a chef somewhere, either like a sous chef I, it probably would still be a few more years before I would be, try to be an executive chef somewhere. But I think that's probably what I'd end up, I would be doing still, which I loved. I used to love working in a kitchen. I loved like the fast paced environment. I loved how it felt like a, a family and that we were in it together. And I really enjoyed it a lot. And I think that's, that's probably what I would have been doing if I wasn't doing this. Can you take us behind the scenes a little bit uh, in like the life of a chef? Because I didn't even know there was like this many levels to, you know, I don't know, just being a chef and operating a kitchen and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I um, worked my way up at there's a place called Zazio's, um, which is like a fine dining Italian place. And you have your like salad, like wine cook where they do like basically like salads and desserts. And that's kind of like the lower end, um, lower end. And then also like dishwasher, obviously, is like the lowest doesn't sound terrible. I love our dishwashers. I appreciate dishwashers, but that's <laughs> the, the lower end. They do the dishwashers do some like um, prep work, like cutting onions or um, doing things that um, you can teach them really quickly and or peel potatoes and things like that. That might not they might not have the same knowledge um, that a chef does. And then um, you have like salads and desserts, and they do a lot of the cold stuff. They prep all of their stations, and then um, you usually have somebody at Zazio's. We had a grill person which would do. They would do the most of the like the entrees. So it'd be like steaks and then they'd make the potatoes. They would prep any of their entree dishes that they need. Like we had a tuna dish, we'd have halibut dish. And then we had a saute person, which um, they did all of the pastas because we, it was like pa- partially like pasta slash American food. Um, and then they would do all the prep work for their station as well. What I did towards the end of that, um, I was doing chef's tables. It was like a stadium seating And these people would basically watch me cook each of their meat or each of their courses. And it would be um, five courses. And so each course I would talk about the dish. I would talk about what went into the prep work, um, just chat about my own life and ask them questions. And then I would plate the food in front of them and then they'd eat the food. And that was honestly like the turning point for me because it was incredibly stressful and terrifying at first because I'm, I'm a very awkward person 90% of the time. And that helped me kind of like come out of my shell and get more personable and feel more comfortable talking to people. Um, So that, that was a huge thing for me. But then other than that, like when you start going up the ranks, like sous chef, basically um, you're doing anything the executive chef asks you to, it could be something super simple, like, Hey, I need you to um, cut these onions for me. Or it could be something more complicated as, Hey, I need you to do walk and order for the day or do the scheduling. Like I did the scheduling and the ordering and then worked on invoices and things like that before I had left Sazio's. And then the chef above me, he would do like a lot of the office work as well. So he actually didn't cook that often on the line. But yeah, you could have fooled us. I mean, you're, you're killing it on the, the interview right now on the podcast. <laughs> um, you're a very good communicator. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What would you say is your specialty dish? What is your favorite thing to make for others? Oh gosh, this is such a tough one. This sounds terrible because I'm like that typical woman who is super indecisive about what I want for food <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I'm always just like, I don't know what I want. Somebody else pick for me. So it's tough because I don't know if I personally have a dish where I'm like, yep, this is my go-to. It's more so I'm one of those people where I want to know what somebody else's go-to dish is or what their favorite food is because I love reenacting or remaking like that food for them and having them just like have their like face light up where they're like oh my gosh this is so good this is my favorite like 
this reminds me of, you know, 10 years ago when I had this dish, or this reminds me of my anniversary. I, I feel like food has a huge connection as to like memories and nostalgia. And so I guess when I think of like go-to dishes, it's really tough for me to say because I always just want to know what other people's go-to dishes are. <laughs> That's awesome that you're always thinking about the other person when you're cooking. I love that. Yeah, it's a very like you have to be you have to have a very like selfless mindset when it comes to cooking because the person next to you like I I used to hate mushrooms hated mushrooms absolutely despised them and then I went to school and once I realized that you can saute them in like ridiculous amounts of butter and like good seasoning salt and stuff they're delicious but there's people that still hate mushrooms they hate the texture of it and so like my opinion of what something good is is completely different to somebody else's opinion of what something good is. Fair enough. I mean, I'm not a big mushroom guy personally. I don't know. I can put mushrooms on everything. (laughs) Everything and anything. (laughs) Nope, same. I think it's a texture thing for some people. They definitely have like a weird texture, especially if they're not cooked. Like I couldn't eat, I would never eat a raw mushroom. The the texture is so weird. I I understand with like the texture because I don't know if you've ever had like an alligator, but so many people love it. But it just, to me, it's just too like slimy for meat. (laughs) Yep. I've had a uh, pig's brain before and that is not a good texture. Don't ever try it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll keep that in mind. Oh I, the flavor is there, but it's the, ugh, yeah. <laughs> my grandpa, we do a lot of pig roast and uh, nobody else eats the brain and he is always the one to go right for it. I'm yep. always, uh, I cannot do that. I just like the regular pig, you know, but not, not the brain. <laughs> the regular cuts. Let's not do the weird stuff. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's how I feel as well. I think the, the craziest thing that I tried and I actually liked was cow tongue. Yeah. That's another, that's another texture one. I like the flavor, but the texture again, it's like, it's too, it almost like comes off as like rubbery. Uh, yeah. It gives me like the heat, <laughs> I, heat like texture wise. <laughs> I think I'm th- I think I'm with you on this one. I, I it would just be too tough for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so going off of all this, what is your favorite dish or what is your go-to dish when you're cooking for yourself or if you were going out to eat? I'm a big fan of risotto. I absolutely love risotto. Like in an ideal world, I think my favorite risotto dish would be like truffle mushroom risotto. It's just super tasty, really simple, and but at the same time, it's a, a little bit complicated to make. But it just has such a good flavor. And I, I grew, I didn't grow up on like very extravagant dishes, if that makes sense. Like I, I used to, I was super picky when I was a kid. Like I wanted grilled cheese and box craft mac and cheese all the time. <laughs> so like when I went to culinary school, there's so many things that I absolutely adored. And risotto and then also gnocchi are like the two that I'm like, those have like a close thing to my heart because they're so good. <laughs> definitely got to try some of that. Yeah, definitely would have to try it. Anything with mushrooms, I'm here for. So right. <laughs> <laughs> we used to sh- uh, shave truffles, like white truffles at Zazio's. And I remember I finally had the task of shaving white truffles. It was about, I believe they were $2,500 a pound of truffles. So yeah, so I would have to shave. I think we were charging, I want to say it was like $20 for an ounce for truffle. And so if I shave too much, I basically was just shaving away money onto somebody's plate. Like it was terrifying because I'm just like, oh my gosh, don't mess it up. Like if I mess it up, I'm just bleeding money. Like. It was so scary. You you tried the uh, white truffle though. You liked it. Oh oh yeah, I love truffle. Truffle is super tasty. We uh, we used white truffle all the time, like when we would cook stuff. And then um, yeah, the black truffle is ideal. That's like the truffle of all truffles. But we used white truffle. So on our uh, last podcast, uh, John he was uh, on the last podcast, and he was talking about truffle butter on tater tots. And then I've also had it on fries and that's, I don't, have you ever had anything like that? Cause that's super good. It's so good. We used to do truffle fries at Zazio's where it was, yeah. Parmesan cheese, truffle, uh, truffle oil and, uh, mm. like parsley as well. Tossed all together. It was so good. Oh yeah. Definitely. One of my favorite, uh, bar foods is any type of truffle with, you know, potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> any truffle potatoes sign me up. Or like loaded potatoes with like bacon, sour cream, and chives. And yeah, just sign me up. And cheese, like ridiculous amounts. I love cheese. 
I agree. That's that's great. Who doesn't? Yeah. You're great. <laughs> I guess I'm pretty uncultured in the space of uh, truffles, but <laughs> I don't think I've ever had them. And why are they so expensive? Is there like a reason for um, that? Well, for one, you can't just grow them. So they are something that they have. you actually have to search for. And they're pretty tricky to find. I know back in the day, I think they changed it to dogs. Back in the day, they actually used pigs to hunt for truffles. But the issue was is that if the pig found the truffle, the pig would usually eat the truffle. So it was kind of counterproductive. I believe that they have dogs now that search for the truffles. Um, so they're a lot more difficult to get a hold of. And it also de- really depends on like the climate too. So if it's if it's too hot or too cold um, certain years, you might not have a really good harvest for getting truffles. So that's a big reason why they're super expensive. They're, they're kind of like a hidden gem that um, take a lot of manpower to get. I believe in uh, France, they actually still do use pigs in some part, uh, some part of France. I, I'm sure it's probably like the ones that are like super, they want to stick to their tradition type of thing, which I, t- I can totally respect. But yeah, I know that a lot of the times the issue is that like the pig would try to like eat the truffles. So, and I don't blame the pig. I mean, right, I don't either. I don't know if I would eat a whole truffle though. Cause they're, if you haven't had truffles before, they, they've got a very like unique earthy flavor that is super, it's indescribable really. Like it's, it's hard to really pinpoint exactly what it tastes like because it's a whole other flavor on its own. Okay. Uh, I'll keep a lookout for them. I might find them on like the side of my house or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wish I could find morels. I don't know if you guys have had morel mushrooms before, but people are hard morel hunters in Michigan. And I wish that I knew a spot because I love morel mushrooms. They're super good. Oh, yeah. On my uh, family's farm, actually, and around the whole area uh, of my hometown, people go out and, you know, find 40, 50, 60 of them plus every year. Yep. I get so jealous because I see people on Facebook. They're like, yeah, I had a good hunt of morel mushrooms. And I'm like, just tell me your spot. I only want like three of them. I just want (laughs) three or four of them. I won't take any more (laughs) because they're super fine and people are really adamant about finding them. I've only ever found a few. I like, like you said, though, I see some of my friends on Facebook, Snapchat, and all that. They'll just come back with like a five gallon bucket of them. I'll be like, yeah, I found like three. Right. Yeah. And I'm just like, I just want a couple. I just want to cook them in like just a little bit of butter. Oh, gosh. They're so good. Nice. So uh, I love the mushroom talk, but uh, <laughs> really terrible out of context. <laughs> No, no, I, I love it. I have all types of mushrooms, truffles, uh, morels are all amazing. Um, <laughs> starting some uh, off topic and fun questions. What would you say your favorite hobby is outside of, you know, working and being at your bar? Well, the first is definitely it's video games for sure. I guess the one pl- plus side of being close for the last two months, I've had two months off mostly. And it's the most time I've had off since I was like 16 years old. So I've been playing a lot of video games. Um, and then another hobby that I've been trying to pick back up is just doing some writing every day, which is nice too. And other than that, I, I like to sing, but I don't really, I'm not in a choir currently, but singing is fun. (laughs) (laughs) What games are you playing right now? Uh, I've been playing a lot of Call of Duty, Modern Warfare, like Warzone, and then also the regular game. I play a a decent amount of Overwatch, but I've been playing a lot of Call of Duty recently. Nice. As far as your content, what uh, type of content do you like writing? Um, I like writing more like fantasy fiction type of thing, kind of just like getting away from all of the chaos and madness that's currently going on in the real world. (laughs) Do you have any books uh, coming out anytime soon? Um, I don't, I do have one that I'm trying to work on. Um, but it's, it's definitely like super, super rough draft. And I think down the road, it would be really fun. Yeah. To like do some publish a book at some point. It is some sort of a goal that I do have. I think it would be pretty cool. Yeah, I'm sure that takes a lot of time, though. So <laughs> it does, yeah. And that's and that's got been kind of a blessing in disguise is that I have all this downtime now that I can actually do some of these things that I haven't done in you know ten plus years because I've been so busy. And so that's just it's been really nice to kind of focus on things that um, I kind of had forgotten about. Yeah, and uh, I got to go back to Call of Duty. So <laughs> what's your KD? Uh, my KD in normal game is, I think like 1.09, I think. Very nice. Better than me. <laughs> yeah. Frank is not too good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I always had to carry him in Warzone. He's always like, you want to play with me? I'm like, ah, I guess I'll give you a win every now and then. Yeah. Right. I feel, feel kind of bad. <laughs> so I had to. 
How many uh, how many Warzone wins do you guys have? I, mean, I only played for like the first week after it came out, and then we started getting like super busy. So I only have three or four. I got gotcha. <laughs> I was going to say, the only time I ever played was when I went to Joey's house. And so, I mean, I've probably played for like a week. I don't know. I gotcha. I think I have a win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I do like it. But like I said, we, we've we been working a lot, having a lot of podcasts, stuff like that. So sadly, we don't get quite as much time as we'd like to, you know? Oh, yeah. No, I totally get it. So I have a good question. Um, do you have any ghost stories? Um, <laughs> I saw this one. I saw this, uh, <laughs> this question and I was like, oh. I kind of feel like my house might potentially have a ghost. I'm not sure though. It might just be crazy, but my, so I've got four pets and my one cat, she's definitely, she's a different cat, but throughout there's been multiple times in the middle of the night where she will be like in a dead sleep and she'll wake up and then she'll stand on her two back legs and just look out the doorway, like out into the hallway and I'm just like, there's got to be something there. Like, there's got to be something there. Because there's there's just no rhyme or reason. She will just, like, look and just mm. stare for, like, a solid, like, minute. And then she'll just, she'll look away and then just go back to sleeping. And I'm just like, what's going on? <laughs> Your closet doors ever randomly open and close? I haven't had any of that happen yet. But I do, I've had it before where, like, it feels like I've heard, like, random, like, thumps like on the because we we primarily live like on our main floor and then we have a bedroom upstairs that we don't use but I've heard like noises from the upstairs and I know there's nothing or anyone up there so I've heard some random noises before and I'm just like I'm not gonna investigate that I'm just gonna if there is something here like we're gonna just live together (laughs) like it's fine (laughs) that's scary uh so do you like believe in that kind of stuff like paranormal and ghosts. Of the- it's tough. Okay, so I don't know if I necessarily believe in like the the whole being possessed, like paranormal activity, like that sort of degree where people are having to like get a priest and <laughs> execute the demon from their body or whatever. I don't know if I go that I I go that far. I do feel like there is there's got to be some sort of like. I don't know, like spirit connection somehow. This makes me totally sound like a weirdo, but like there's got to be like something that like connects between like whatever is up there and here. And uh, yeah, I guess kind of, if that makes sense. <laughs> I 100% believe in that kind of stuff. So. Oh yeah, we, we both have, have had some crazy uh, ghosts in our life. So we definitely believe in it. <laughs> what is your craziest story? I would like to actually hear. I'm very curious. The, the best one that I can think of recently was last year, uh, my roommate and I, we, we just moved into a new house this year, but last year when, when we were at our old house, this, this weird stuff would happen all the time. Like air vents would be pushed off the wall after like not being in the house for a couple of days at a time. Like I remember I went home for Super Bowl Sunday and then I came back on the following Monday and the air vent in my room, which, I mean, this is like an iron vent, like this thing is heavy. It yeah, was about yeah. three feet removed from the wall. And I what? asked all my roommates, I was like, did anybody go in my room? And then they were like, no, I like it. it. It was crazy. Um, and then other stuff like around the house too, like our medicine cabinet would be wide open sometimes. And that's how we decided, that's how we found that we had a medicine cabinet in our bathroom because what? Evan and I, we didn't even know we had one until we just walked by one day and it was wide open. What? Yeah, and just kind of like weird stuff like that would happen all the time. Lights, like I would leave my bathroom or I would leave my bedroom to go to my bathroom like in the middle of the night or something. And mm-hmm. then I would come back and my light would be off, even though I just turned it on to go to the bathroom and just what? weird stuff like that. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> I, I actually have two. Um, so I'll start with the less scary one. Um, <laughs> so my old apartment complex I used to live in, um, for one, I would always close my closet door and it was like a super heavy one. And I'd always wake up in the next morning and it was open. And then if it was open, I would wake up in the morning and it was closed. And I swear, obviously, like, nobody else was going in my room. And I, I never understood how that happened. And then yeah. one day, I was showering. It was probably, like, 8 a.m. And I thought I heard a whisper in the shower. And I'm like, no, I'm just crazy, right? I'm just crazy. I go and, like, sit down whenever it's, like, noon. And then my um, roommate's girlfriend was like, dude, you're going to think I'm crazy? But I think at like when I shower in this morning at like 8 a.m., I heard a whisper. And I was like, no, you what? didn't. No way. I was like, I heard one too. Like, I jumped out of the shower after this had happened, right? Like, yeah, I, was, yeah. I wasn't messing around. I jumped out of the shower and ran to my bed and like just 
curled up in a bar in the corner. And uh, so I was pretty scared. Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow, that would be terrifying. Especially, too, that, like, she said that and there was no prompting it. Like, that's nuts. And that's, and that's what, like, got me a little nervous after. Because, like, I wasn't going to bring it up, because well, she was going to think I was crazy. And then she's right. on the story, you're going to think I was crazy. I was like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my uh, gosh. That's nuts. Yeah, so we, we definitely have had some firsthand experiences with uh, some cash bursts. Do you still live at the place that, like, that you could hear the whisper? Oh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> nope, right out uh, there. Thankfully, it was only a year lease, and that was like one month before we left. So that wherever that goes, that goes is not haunting somebody else. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely have like I I've told myself like I'm like all right if there's someone here I was like we're cool like let's be buddies like because I will be my husband and I own the house and so it's one of those things where I'm just like yeah man like you do you like I'll do me like it's fine we don't have to worry about having any sort of issues or arguments or anything (laughs) but and that's like I have like conversations in my head with like the if there's a ghost in my house like hey please just let me live in peace that's all I ask (laughs) I think that's the best way to handle ghosts is just let them do their own thing and then you do your thing and try not to uh, butt heads or anything exactly yeah rather than being like I need to call someone to get a priest in here yeah, that's, a, that's, a, holy water. <laughs> that's how you get more spirits. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> uh, what, what is the most thrill-seeking thing you've ever done? Apart from owning a business, because I feel like that's probably the most thrill-seeking thing I've ever done. Other than that, I feel like I haven't really had a lot of thrill-seeking experiences. When I was a kid, I used to have horses, and I would probably always go way too fast on my horses. I guess that would be thrill-seeking. And then other than that, I am a huge roller coaster fanatic, and so I would always go to Cedar Point and ride in the front of all of the roller coasters. Hands up and everything. Oh yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, I would always want to be in the front row too, like on um, like it's called the Ultimate Dragster. Oh yeah, you guys are from Ohio, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, you know Cedar Point, like. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, that that probably is going to be like the most like thrill seeking. I feel like I've. I've lived a pretty uneventful life aside from the the journey of being a business owner. Hey, Cedar Point's still fun though, so that's that's a good one. It's crazy. Fun. Some people some people are scared to even you know like look at a roller coaster. Yep. <laughs> yeah, my husband absolutely hates hates heights, hates them, and so he's just like, nope, like I'm never gonna go on a roller coaster that high ever, which is totally fine because my mom and I are huge roller coaster fans, so. Well, we end up going. We, I think we went for my mom's 60th birthday and we got the fast pass, which is the best thing in the world because you just walk through all of the lines. I love it. Yeah, you can go on all the roller coasters in like, you know, three hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. The last time I was there, it was like, I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was like during school hours or something, but I went in like early May and there was nobody there. It was so awesome. And be able to go right. through, like I rode like the Millennium Force like twice the Maverick and then the dragster all within like an hour. Like, you can get lucky sometimes. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. You know, you really can. Like, yeah, I usually don't get that lucky when I go. It's usually like four hours for the Maverick and stuff like that. Last time we were there, two rides yeah. broke down. It was very sad. <laughs> oh, that's a huge bummer. I know. You do hate to see that. This is my final question. I don't know if Frankie has any. Um, what is one place you have won in the past and that you would recommend to people? Um, like in regards of like food or bars or um, vacation or bar vacation, maybe a bar you went to while on vacation. Um, well, I definitely would recommend in Orlando going to that, uh, the player one video game bar that I went to that inspired LFG. Um, in regards of vacation, I really, really love, uh, Key West. That was a really great, we, my husband and I went there for our honeymoon and, um, we went to like the non-touristy places, which was really great because um, we kind of went to the place where all of like the Key West natives go to. And it was just really relaxing and just gorgeous down there the entire time. And then in regards of food in Kalamazoo, personally, um, I really like the beer exchange. Uh, that's a really cool place. They do like a stock market with beer, which is a really cool concept. Um, and their nachos are really good. I have a craving for their nachos, but I think they're closed right now and it makes me so sad. (laughs) Um, and then for like 
restaurant type place. My mom and I love going to um, a place in Augusta and it's called Nina's and it's this little like hole in the wall Mexican restaurant and it's crazy good at like authentic Mexican food. I absolutely love it. That all sounds I'm like so summer. hungry. Like my <laughs> stomach's actually hurting now after all of this, like talking about all the food. <laughs> I know I'm going to get some food right after <laughs> <Yeah>. this. <laughs> uh, all right. I guess my last question would be, what is a life lesson that you've learned that you'd like to share with others? A big life lesson for me is that it's okay if you fail. I've had a lot of different, I guess, failures in my life. I, one example being is that I wanted to go to veterinary school um, right when I got out of high school and I went to Michigan State and I ended up dropping out. And then at one point I wanted to be a writer and then I ended up dropping out. I went to KVCC. It's okay if you fail um, because at some point you learn enough in your life to where you realize these failures are what make you stronger. So if like you feel that things aren't looking up right at this moment, you'll look back on it, you know, maybe five, 10, 20 years from now and think, oh, hey, that wasn't so bad. Look where I'm at right now. So I think that's one big thing that I've learned over the course of my life. Yeah, that's applicable to anyone. I mean, not everyone can be great at everything. So I'm um, just learning from those past experiences and then building exactly. on it. Exactly. Yep. All right. Well, this has been a great podcast. Where can everybody catch you on social media? Um, so you can catch us on Facebook. Um, it's LF Gaming Bar. And then you can also catch us on Instagram, which is a little bit different. It's LFG underscore gaming bar. And then um, Twitch is another one, too, that we always do. And that one's LFG underscore bar. Um, And we hang out all the time on Twitch, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We do our Jackbox party pack games. We also do giveaway on Fridays um, for local businesses. Um, And then, yeah, check us out on our social media. And then our website is also um, LFGamingBar.com. Yep. And yeah, I think that's a wrap. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it.